Good afternoon, fellow colleagues. Uh, we just want to give it another three minutes. I see people are still joining in. And then we'll get into this very exciting launch. Uh, by my watch, it's about four past. I will start at around seven minutes past three because we have a very, very short time for this launch. So kindly bear with us. Uh, I see quite a number of people are still logging in. Thank you. Good afternoon, fellow colleagues. I hope you can hear me. My name is Rehab Mundara. I work for UN Habitat and I'm going to be the moderator for this great, exciting launch of the Quick Guide to Bus Sector Modernization. This guide was prepared partnership between UN Habitat and the Institute for Transportation and Development Policy. And it is indeed in booklet form, very easy to follow. And we hope you've looked at it because today we just have an hour where we want to expose a few things that are in that document. Many of you, particularly the Kenyans, must be very, very excited that we are on the journey to improving our public transport to a more efficient, sustainable, accessible public transport. There is a lot that is happening. 
And this initiative is just adding on to the many dots that uh, we have embarked in as a country. So I'm very glad to see each one of you. We have with us some special guests who will give us some opening remarks. I was just going through the list of participants. I see a number of familiar faces, others I may not know, uh, but I want to each one of you to feel very welcome for this short session. We'll try and keep to the hour and just to expose us to the program. Uh, Carol, if you could just share the agenda briefly so that we can all interact with it. I'll appreciate. As I said, the guide has been prepared by UN Habitat together with ITDP, with financial support from the African Development Bank, and with many contributions of many of you. We appreciate uh, partnerships over the years. Uh, Carol, are we able to get the screen? Are we able to get the agenda on the screen? Thank you. So if you can see the screen, we were expecting to have Ambassador Jambi, the Kenya Permanent Mission to UN Habitat representative, but Her Excellency is not going to be with us, but we are privileged to have Omar Sila, the Director of Regional Office for Africa, UN Habitat, who is going to give us a few remarks. Heather Thompson, the Chief Executive Officer for ITDP, and then Neji Larbi, the urban mobility expert from ADB. Uh, we are going to have very few remarks from those people. Afterwards, Chris Cost, the Africa Director for the Institute of Transportation and Development Policy, will take us through to the quick guide. And then Heather Thompson, will speak to the official launch, just brief remarks. After that, we thought it's a good idea to have a panel discussion where a few experts will tell us a little of their experiences in trying to modernize uh, the bus sector in their countries, particularly the Kenyan scenario. So after that, a quick Q&A shouldn't take long. And just to tell you that this is not your usual webinar, that's a training session or anything. This is just a session to reflect on where we are at and where we are going and what we can do to accelerate uh, the utilization of these guidelines. So without further ado, allow me to welcome our speakers during this uh, ceremony. And we'll begin with Omar, yes. and then we'll have uh, uh, Heather and Lab the following. Thank you, Omar, you're welcome. And thank you very much, uh, Rahab, uh, for giving me this opportunity to attend this uh, very important event, you know, related to the launch of this uh, guide for bus sector modernization. So let me thank as well uh, this collaboration between uh, African Development Bank and I. The ITDP UN Habitat colleague as well for this great work they are doing. And this launch is very timely because we learn a lot from this COVID-19, how important is the transport sector, you know, uh, toward, you know, uh, improving, you know, the health system and uh, more broadly as well in allowing, you know, people to manage their, their space, but also look in different area uh, in terms of improving livability of the cities. Of course, now I think that the challenge that many African cities are facing, and uh, for us uh, to to achieve this uh, SDG uh, is very important as well that uh, we get right our transport system. So we know that uh, transport cut across you know many SDGs, even all we can say, and this target uh, 11.2, you know, uh, which is talking about access to safe, affordable, accessible, and sustainable transport system, uh, shall be provided for all, which is our goal for you know when we think about policy and regulatory framework. Also, socially speaking, we want to be inclusive. 
leaving no one behind. And the transport system is one area as well where this democratization of access is, is very important uh, for cities and for communities as well. That's the reason why we need uh, this long-term policy, but also promoting realistic business model, which may be based on government and private sector partnership. And this partnership is very important that we are showing in this process of validating this skill guide. So as you may know it, uh, UN Habitat is leading and monitoring the SDG 11.2 and tracking the use of access of public transportation system while encouraging you know, a move to reducing the reliance of end of their car based transport. So this includes improving the access and mobility for transport for disadvantaged group. And that's where we talk about this issue of no, leaving no one behind, such as elderly citizens, physically challenged individuals, and low-income households. So this accessibility-based urban mobility paradigm critically needs good, high-cost capacity transport system that are well integrated into multimodal arrangement with the public transport access point located with comfortable walking or cycling distance. So UN Habitat has established uh, this database. Uh, I mean, you heard about it uh, on SDG 11.2, which include 1,260 cities from all region. And this depicts a global average for access to public transport of 52%. So you see this disparity and this inequality coming from this system. So you can see between continents, the variation we have. And uh, in North America, we are talking about 92%. And Europe uh, uh, and Africa, 30% of accessibility in Sub-Saharan Africa. So it means that we have a long way to go uh, for Africa to fill the gap in terms of access to public transport. But something you need to acknowledge as well, which has impact on what we are discussing today, is the impact of urbanization in Africa, which is coming with along with a lot of challenges, uh, you know, in terms of mobility of people. That's the reason why the absence of high quality, dignified, secure public transport, uh, promoting vehicle and uh, the promotion of uh, vehicle use to grow faster than the global average. So we can see this trend where automotive uh, sales in Africa are expected to not just double or triple, but increase six by 2035. That's a challenge we are going to face with this individual uh, transport system. So African cities will have uh, additional people. We are talking about 900, 9 million, 900 million new residents by 2050, which is going to make Africa, Africa the most rapid urbanization in the planet. But yet the promise of opportunity rem remain out of reach for vast communities living in urban areas where poor, poor access to job, education, healthcare, and social opportunity severely limited people's ability to escape poverty and enter the middle class. I think we see now the linkages between the transport system and economic development. And if you look at the example of Nairobi, with this long transit, I think we can see those challenges people are facing to get into the job point. So many African cities do not yet have modern transport system, of course. It's more about informal, Uncoordinated paratransit services still comprise to 80% of public transport in African cities. So we can take the example of Johannesburg. For example, only 4.7% of poor residents living in the vast periphery have access to rapid transit and especially tenuous lifetime to economic opportunity. So which means that we are far from these 15 minute cities we are promoting uh, during this COVID-19. The poor quality of public transport disproportionately affect vulnerable users. Poor workers living in the urban periphery, typically under one to two hours commute via uncoordinated informal services, with half of their workers spending 30 to 40 percent or more in their take home pay on bus fare. Another dimension of, uh, on this inclusion beyond this uh, economic dimension is the condition of women. So we know that women are experiencing those challenges often time, and they tend to heavily rely on informal public transport and make it more complex in our trip chain, often outside core area where services tend to be less frequent and accessible. Another dimension is the fear of sexual harassment, which is bringing the aspect of security. Abroad public transport remain a great concern while moving around in the cities. So today we know that in order to achieve the SDGs, as I mentioned earlier in my address, 
it is therefore of utmost importance to bring forward policy and investment decision toward modern public transport. We hope that this quick guide will be useful for decision makers and practitioners as it shows how some cities have managed to successfully create high quality bus services at affordable prices for all and in alignment with the SDGs. So you may see that this guide is of demand now where we are in Africa, where people are looking a way of modernizing, you know, this public bus system, but at the same time looking now in the new dimension of health system, so which is uh, giving, you know, relevance to this work you are doing and would like to congratulate uh, for this hard work all actors involved in this partnership and we look forward to the implementation of this guide thank you very much Raha, for giving me this opportunity back to you thank you very much omar for highlighting the challenges in the african cities and the targets that we need to meet as we fulfill the sdgs i'll now want to welcome heather thompson to also address us thank you very much heather you have the floor Thank you. Thank you, everybody. And thank you for um, having me with you. I'm very excited to be joining from New York City, um, which is where ITDP is headquartered. Um, this is uh, such an exciting launch. Um, for those of you that don't know ITDP, ITDP works around the world to develop high quality public transport systems and policy solutions that make cities more livable, equitable and sustainable. In many cities where we work, a lack of government involvement and investment in public transport systems has led to the underdevelopment of the public transport sector. The public transport vehicles are often individually owned, leading to unhealthy competition among operators. The fleet is substandard and the quality of service is low. Existing services cater to rush hour commutes, but fail to meet the needs of caregivers, school children, and people with disabilities all of whom deserve equal access to opportunities. Those who have money choose to use private cars leading to increasing traffic congestion and pollution. And I know all of you there in Nairobi know that all too well. With a majority of city residents in many cities reliant on public transport, it's critical that we find ways to improve the quality and reliability of the service. ITDP has been working in cities around the world to transform the existing informal sector into modern cooperatives or bus operating companies that operate under a new regulatory environment established by the government. In Jakarta, institutional reforms and improvements in public transport operating contracts have been key to enhancing performance of the TransJakarta BRT system. In addition, TransJakarta integrated minibus feeder systems by negotiating per kilometer payments with the operators. Under the new operating licenses, operators need to have an electronic fare collection system, a reliable and well-maintained fleet, and professionally timely services and salaried employees. And this has led to a huge increase in passengers and revenue for TransJakarta. They now have a million passengers, or at least pre-COVID, pre they were up to about a million passengers a day on TransJakarta, so a huge achievement. In South Africa, the introduction of BRT has ushered in the formation of modern bus operating companies comprised of former minibus taxi operators. The companies operate under a new service contract and the transformation has brought about better working conditions and improved service for passengers. In Brazil, we are working to improve the quality of city bus contracts both to enhance customer experiences and also to establish an environmental framework for the introduction of a modern e-bus, um, electric bus technology. In all of these cases, governments have played a key role in fostering the transformation process. Governments have taken steps to strengthen internal capacity to monitor and improve service quality and have engaged in dialogue with the private sector. The quick guide to bus sector modernization draws on the lessons learned from these projects and lays out key principles of the management of the bus system. Improved quality of service requires having clear operational plan grounded in robust demand analysis, enabling efficient operations, time savings and affordable trips. In cities like Nairobi, this means having routes that do not necessarily start or end at the central business district. Operations should be planned with input from the private sector, given their deep understanding of the system. 
In order to have quality services, there's need for a road worthy fleet an integrated electronic fare collection system and professionally trained drivers. Infrastructure planning should include fleet specifications and quality bus stops, terminals and depots. Seamless pedestrian access is essential. On busy corridors, cities should implement high quality BRT corridors to enable buses to bypass the jam. The transition process should also incorporate a clear business plan to ensure that service provision is sustainable and attainable. The COVID-19 pandemic has reinforced the need for an improved operating strategy that includes subsidies for social impact. Cities like Kigali have begun subsidizing bus service to keep operations running smoothly without compromising public health and affordable affordability. And this is a trend that we're seeing all over the world. Over the years, we have, been a, we have seen a positive shift in the public transport sector in Africa. Cities like Dar es Salaam and Kigali in East Africa are transitioning to be more efficient and reliable public transport systems. The restructuring of the industry has been spearheaded by the respective governments through improved infrastructure and more efficient operations. We look forward to seeing a similar shift in cities across the continent. And with that, uh, I, I really hope that this guidebook can provide a lot more detail guidance on all of those things. Thank you again for having me here this morning. And thank you to the African Development Bank for their support for the project and the partnership with UN Habitat. Thank you very much, Heather. I've had you repeat lack of government involvement is what has led to a very inefficient public transport. We hope that that can change in the continent. And thank you also for drawing our attention to successful case studies, Trans Jakarta, Kigali, Dar es Salaam. I'm sure we'll hear from you again, uh, but for now, allow me to invite Laubi from ADB to address us. Again, thank you very much ADB for supporting this initiative financially. Uh, I'm hoping that Lavi Neji is still connected. I had seen the name on the list of participants. Kindly yes, yes. address us. Thank you. Yes. Uh, thank you, Rahab, for this uh, opportunity to present. Uh, some elements of the African Development Bank. And thank you for the launch of the quick guide uh, to bus sector modernization. Uh, we participated on, uh, on this for, by a few comments on the first uh, version. Uh, the bank uh, is uh, thinking intervention to improve public transport in Africa. Uh, now we have a new division uh, called the uh, PQ2 uh, Urban uh, Development and uh, Mobility uh, Division. And we are planning uh, uh, public transportation intervention in Africa by improving bus fleet, clean technologies, uh, schedules and routes. Also by providing uh, technical assistance to public transport companies to improve uh, fleet management training, route optimization training, implementation of uh, new operations management and monitoring technologies, uh, implementation of uh, softwares for operations management, studies and uh, economic uh, works uh, studies, to optimize operation of the circulating fleet, but you know, uh, in Africa right now, we have a lot of problems with uh, the public transportation as the majority of the operators are from informal or what we call paratransit. And uh, our interventions will be to, uh, to understand better the situations in each country and to come to help these operators uh, not only the public ones or the governmental ones but also the informal ones by inciting the governments to help and finance 
the modernization of the fleet of uh, paratransit. We have uh, very, very old uh, vehicles with these people and uh, we are very, <clears throat> very bad for the environment and for the clean technologies. The, the, the vehicles are about uh, 15 to 20 years age. And uh, this is a very, very big problem as in our big cities in uh, principle in the capitals. Uh, we are living in Abidjan and we see this every day. We have a lot of problems with the taxi, the BACA, the paratransit and the, uh, the safety. The safety is very, very important in this uh, public transport uh, systems. We, uh, we have a lot of crowded uh, vehicles. They are not respecting the, 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 the specifications of the uh, density of the capacities of the vehicles, etc. So uh, uh, we are going to uh, to help countries to, to come over these problems little by little. But the financing uh, and the funds are very uh, important to finance this uh, kind of uh, <coughs> of activities. So, uh, but we are here to help. And uh, this guide is very important for us while it's talking about the modernization of buses, of vehicles, of fleets, etc. And this is what we need in uh, the majority of countries and uh, maybe all countries. And uh, we have a, a, a big problem to finance uh, this uh, task of modernization. So uh, we will be happy to. Uh, cooperate with the IT, ITPD, ITD, Institute of Public Transportation. <clears throat> and uh, we talked with a few people in this uh, institute. We are happy to cooperate together for this uh, task. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Neji. We appreciate the assurance that ADB is only ready to support the continent in its endeavor to improve and modernize the bus transport. Exactly. Thank you to our keynote speakers. We appreciate the encouragement. We appreciate the reassurance. And uh, we thought it was a good idea if Chris took us through this quick guide, just highlighting what it contains uh, my colleague Steffi has posted the link. For those of you who have not had an opportunity to read the guide, it's already available. The link has been available. Thank you, Steffi. And uh, Chris is the Africa Program Director for ITDP, a very passionate person in terms of public transport, an avid rider and cyclist who dares cycle in the streets of Nairobi. And Chris, we are welcome you to take us through uh, the guide. Thank you very much, Chris. Great, thanks so much, Rob. So yeah, it's, let me share my screen and, and get into this presentation. So yeah, it's really our pleasure to be here to launch the guide on bus sector modernization. Um, yeah, as Rob said, like this was really born out of a, you know, an understanding that the, the current status quo in our cities is, is untenable. Um, and, and we really need to see how, how to improve public transport services so that we can meet um, the mobility goals that we have. So I wanna give a quick overview of the guide um, so that you have a sense of some of the key elements. So yeah, as I said, you know, we, we face a lot of challenges in our existing public transport systems in, in many of the cities where we live. So you know, to highlight a few of them, you know, one of the key issues is that all the risk is borne by the private sector, right? And, and in return, government can't expect much in terms of service quality, okay? So this is something that, you know, we have to change that equation if we wanna see the service improve. Um, you know, drivers are compensated based on the, the number of passengers, you know, otherwise known as a target system. And, and this results in a lot of issues. You know, we have crashes happening all the time. Um, poor working conditions for the, the drivers and conductors, and, and then customers ended up, end up being treated really rough um, when they're trying to board the vehicles. Um, and then oftentimes these, these route networks, as Heather mentioned, are not geared toward passenger convenience. You know? So you have cases like Nairobi that you can see the, the map of public transport routes down here, where all the routes converge on the CBD because operators are trying to optimize 
their service to, to you know, go into that, uh, the high demand that's available there. Um, and, but if people need to move across town, they have to make really inconvenient transfers. So, so it's not optimized at all um, with the customer's uh, benefit in mind. And then we have vehicles that in, you know, in many cases are not roadworthy or in, you know, at least highly polluting. And, and so these are all the things that we need to change. And what we tried to do in the guide was to come up with some of the key principles you know, based on the experience that, that ITDP, UN Habitat, um, AFDB, and, and people who need cities have had in, in working on bus systems and BRT systems around the world and the kinds of um, incentives that can help generate better service. So one of the fundamental ideas in the guide is that we, we have to have action on, on two fronts. So on the one hand, we need to work with the private sector um, to modernize, to consolidate companies so that they can provide high quality service. But there also has to be effort from government. So government needs to play a more active role in regulating, planning, and managing the public transport system if we want to see better outcomes. So let me start out with the government regulation piece. That's, that's where we start in the guide and talk about some of the key ideas. So the guide talks about the need to move, to evolve from, you know, currently we usually have either commercial operating licenses where you can just operate anywhere in the city or sometimes route licenses. We need to shift toward more formal service contracts where the, the operators are, are compensated um, in a formal way there, the contract lays out the standards and gives a clearer framework for the operations that need to happen. So let's look at some of the elements that need to go into that contract. Uh, a key one is how having clarity on how the operators will be compensated. And many cities are, are shifting from the idea of a net cost contract where the operators collect the fares directly and then sometimes pay a license fee or parking fee to government to what's known as a gross cost contract where the revenue goes into a trust fund and then it's paid out to the different operators who are involved in running the system. And that includes not only the bus operators, but also fare collection operators, the trust fund manager, and so on. And what this does is it, it provides a clear framework if the government decides to subsidize the service, you have a transparent way of doing that. And these payments are done with service level adjustments so you can actually start to manage quality. Now, in the contract, you, you really have to answer the question of how the risk is going to be allocated because having an effective uh, contracting structure is all about having a, an effective allocation of risk that matches the level of demand and other factors on the quarter. And the basic idea is that if government starts sharing some of that risk, then it can demand a higher quality of service, right? So there are different risk sharing options. You know, one is paying based on the number of kilometers entirely. Um, where these are monitored by GPS. You know, another is to have a sort of mixed payment structure where there's some component uh, based on the number of passengers, but still the bulk of the payment is based on kilometers. Um, and, and finally, you know, if, if the government's not ready to move that far, you could still base the, the, the payments on the total revenue that's coming in, but allocate them among the operators based on kilometers. So in all these cases, you're trying to separate the payment from the having it directly reliant on passengers as is the case today. And, and in doing so, we need to regulate competition um, because competition presents financial risk both for government and the operators. So we need to do something about that. Okay. Um, and then there's a the question of subsidies. So you know, increasingly cities are realizing, and, and especially during the, the COVID-19 pandemic, as, as we've heard from the other speakers, um, you know, cities are increasingly realizing that it's not tenable to expect operators to provide the same level of service and meet the public health guidelines um, while, you know, collecting the same fare levels that we had before the pandemic. You know, so if, if we expect all that to happen, it's just not going to add up. We have to start providing some public support if we want good service. And, and so if we do that, you know, there are ways that the subsidies can be managed. So uh, a key thing is having a, a good service plan and financial model that are based on, on the passenger demand. You know, you need to have a robust idea of the actual demand. Um, and then having mechanisms to adjust the fares and the operator payments um, to help mitigate the, the burden on government. But at the end of the day, subsidies are, are going to be increasingly important going forward if we want to 
meet the other mobility goals that we have. Um, and then it's also critical um, to talk about who will be responsible for each aspect of the system. And what the guide recommends is first for, for the bus fleet, this is generally best done by the operators because they have a, a better sense of what vehicles to buy. They can negotiate with the manufacturers. And if, if the operators own the vehicles, they'll have a better incentive to maintain them. The depots, on the other hand, should be managed by government, right? The government should build and own them because that way, um, you, you know, if the operator changes, government still has ownership of that depot. And usually the, the sharing of responsibility there is that the government provides the basic depot facilities, but then the operators bring in the tools and furnishings and other removable equipment. Um, and then finally for fare collection, uh, it's really important to have independent fare collection and the fare collection operator should be answerable to government so, so that there's an independent check on the revenue and also so that you have public access to the system data um, because that's really useful for service planning. And this also allows you to have multiple operators using the same fare collection system, which can streamline um, the, the, the fare collection, okay? So that's from the regulatory side. And then the, the guide next goes into what kind of change do we want to see on the part of private sector? And so, as I mentioned, you know, a key aspect of that is moving from the individual owner operators that we have today toward having more consolidated operating units. And this can take different forms. It could be a company, it could be a, a cooperative, um, but that, that company needs to be better structured than the way usually what we have today, where you know, each vehicle is owned by an individual investor. Um, and then at the same time, we need to change the way that staff are compensated because that's what will give us the, the benefits of better road safety and better customer service. So the, the guide talks about the elements of the transition. So how, how you can get there, um, having a clear process. Um, and it starts with having, thinking about the incentives. So, you know, oftentimes that can take the form of fleet renewal. You know, maybe the government's going to provide some support to the, the bus purchase. Um, maybe there's a new service plan that's being introduced or maybe a BRT quarter. And, and so those things can provide motivation for private sector to actually engage and, and want to participate in this process. Um, and then it's important to have a transparent way of identifying who's affected, you know, whether they're fully partially affected and so on. And, and once the affected operators are, are identified, they should elect their leadership. And, and this may differ from existing, you know, groupings or associations that are there. And, and so it's important to have, you know, a clear idea of who's actually affected on the quarter in question. And, and then you need to decide what type of tender you want to have, you know, are you going to have a, a managed competitive tender or are you going to go for a negotiated contract with the existing operators? And there can be a lot of benefits to a, a competitive tender in terms of keeping the timeline short and making the process more transparent um, for all to see. Um, but there are also ways if you're going for a negotiated contract um, to mitigate the risk for both parties and the guide goes into some of them. Um, and then you want to ensure that this process results in, in, you know, in the modern bus companies. And, and so the guide talks about some of the key qualities. And, and this is something where government, again, can work with the, the, the private sector to provide the support um, to, to embody these elements. So centralized ownership of the fleet, having enough reserve fleet so that, you know, today the way it works is some, if, you're, if the bus is broken down, you just don't operate. So that needs to change. You know, we need to have reliable, dependable service. Um, having the fleet secured in the modern depot, having IT-based operations control and, and maintenance scheduling, um, the salaried staffing, obviously, and, and meeting good co corporate governance standards. Those are all key components. And it's also important to have a focus on the, the labor and gender standards that the new companies are able to achieve. So looking at priority hiring lists where the staff can be drawn from the affected operators that were identified in, in the earlier stage in the transition process, um, having workplace benefits, and ensuring that there's adequate gender representation um, so that we, you know, we address the, the lopsided staffing that we have in the sector today. So that's a very quick you know, whirlwind um, overview of the highlights of the guide, um, but we encourage everyone to, to download it, have a look, 
and, and do uh, send us any feedback you have. And, and we look forward to working with more cities to ensure that we have very high quality service and really transform the public transport sector. Thanks. Thanks, Chris, for that uh, very, very quick analysis, I think, highlight of the guide. I could hear you struggling to go over it quickly, but I think you covered it very, very well. Uh, and like you say, people should read it, engage, and many more cities should endeavor to begin applying it so that we make a difference. Uh, we wondered how do we launch after all of this? Uh, so I invite Heather again to take us through a short launch after which we'll have a panel of experts, like I said, and I hope you are shooting your short questions, observations and comments on the chat so that we can also give some feedback, uh, especially if you have issues to raise with the speakers that we've already had. So Heather, kindly, uh, please address us. Again. Yes, please. Well, I just want to uh, follow on Chris's great presentation um, with some of the basics from the plan to officially launch the plan today. Um, I know we'll hear uh, from the panel on some conversations on how it can be implemented going forward. But, but with this, I'd like to officially launch the plan. Um, I think it will be extremely useful, especially in this time as we're all dealing with COVID. It's a real uh, opportunity to focus on the public transport system uh, to improve it for the health of our cities and the health of, of people. And I know many, many cities around the world are thinking about how they can improve their systems um, to make it more affordable, to make the business operations uh, um, much more efficient. And the government certainly has a huge role to play in that. And this is really an opportunity for, for cities all over the world to take that responsibility and, and move in the right direction. Um, so again, this is the official launch of the guidebook. I hope it's useful to you and all of your colleagues in cities, and we look forward to seeing the progress that can be made. Thank you so much again for your support. Thank you, Heather. Of course, if you were in a hotel on a face-to-face, -face, would be tossing to this launch, would be, you know, cutting some ribbon. Please imagine it happening, but allow us to move forward in the interest of time. Uh, I'll now welcome Engineer Jerry Buru, my friend and colleague, the country manager for Kenya, ITDP, to take us through the panel. She'll introduce the panelists, and then after that, like I said, we'll have a quick Q&A. Engineer, over to you. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> thank you so much, uh, Rehab. Uh, I'll start uh, by introducing our panelists this afternoon. Uh, we have uh, Engineer Frances Gitau. Engineer Frances Gitau has been very, very supportive uh, to ITDP, and he is the acting director uh, general of the Namata Nairobi Metropolitan Area Transport Authority. He is also the infrastructure secretary in the Ministry of Transport, Infrastructure, Housing, Urban Development, and Public Works. It's a very long name and he holds other prominent positions in government. So he's actually very key in this process of uh, uh, transitioning the public uh, transport uh, to a modern transport uh, system. He's a professional civil engineer with many years experience in the transport uh, sector. Welcome, uh, engineer Francis Gitau, and we thank you very much for finding time uh, within your very busy schedule to join us. Uh, our second uh, 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 panelist is Annie Winstock. Annie is a, the president of People-Oriented Cities, a consulting firm working on BRT worldwide. She has 18 years experience in public, private, and nonprofit transport planning. Annie launched a program 
to bring the gold standard BRT to cities across the US. So uh, we are going to learn a lot from Annie Winstock. Welcome so much, Annie, and thank you so much uh, for joining us. We also are privileged to have uh, Mr. Edwin Mukabana. Mr. Mukabana is the Managing Director of Kenya Bus Service uh, Limited, one of the oldest uh, privately owned public transport operators in Nairobi. And M Mr. Mukabana is also the chairman of the, Na the National Federation for Public Transport Operators in Nairobi. Welcome, Mr. Edwin Mukabana, and thank you so much uh, for joining us. Uh, uh, we have uh, little time to cover this. I'm hoping that we are going to be able to cover uh, some issues on COVID, uh, the pandemic, which is uh, the current uh, very big challenge facing all of us and indeed really affecting the, the public transport sector. We also would like to touch on labor issues, uh, risks related to public transport reforms. Uh, also, we want to touch on technology, uh, integration of the various modes of transport and the air quality uh, in our cities. Uh, I'll start uh, uh, by with a question to Engineer Gitao. Uh, Engineer Gitao uh, as uh, Heather and uh, uh, Chris mentioned, it is a requirement by government that public health protocols are observed in public transport vehicles. And because of that, Matatus have had to reduce the number of passengers that they are transporting and provide sanitizers for their uh, the customers, their passengers. This has an obvious uh, cost implica implications uh, on their uh, on doing business. Unfortunately, the additional cost has been transferred to the passengers, and that results uh, uh, to very high fares. And most passengers are not able, or most commuters uh, are not able to access. Uh, uh, many economic and social uh, facilities. However, we realize that uh, in cities like Kigali, Jakarta, public transport is actually uh, subsidized by the government. So, uh, Mr. Gitao, you can tell us, has the government of Kenya considered subsidizing public transport during COVID-19 and perhaps in future to ensure that the service remains affordable to the common person in Kenya. Welcome, uh, Engineer Gitao. I hope your network is good. Uh, Engineer Gita, can you hear us? Uh, while we are waiting for Engineer Gita, I uh, will pose the next question uh, to Annie. Annie Winstock. Annie, uh, perhaps you can tell us something on based on your experience in other cities in Africa and beyond. How can the government of Kenya leverage on the prevailing uh, pandemic situation to reform the matatu industry and enhance order, safety, comfort, and uh, user friendliness of the public transport system? Hi, thanks for having me here. Um, so uh, because of the pandemic, a lot of cities have been experiencing much lower traffic. Um, and as a result, some cities have been reclaiming street space, uh, giving some street space to bicycles, buses, pedestrians. Um, Paris has already 
given more than 50 kilometers of street space to bike lanes. New York has done a bus only street, reclaimed some parking for outdoor dining. Dublin has been pedestrianizing downtown, downtown streets. And, um, and so it, it is an optimal time to implement something like BRT. Uh, in turn, BRT can uh, represent a unique opportunity to reform the taxi industry because dedicated infrastructure means that the buses can move faster um, which is really uh, a significant enticement to convince the industry to reform. So, I mean, what I mean is that the government would offer st these speed increases in exchange for corporatization of the, of the industry, cleaner buses, centralized fleet maintenance, et cetera. Um, <laughs> some cities are also, as, as has al already been mentioned, um, some cities are also offering some stimulus now during the pandemic to trade associations. Uh, Kumasi in Ghana is, is doing that. Um, Dakar, Abidjan, Addis, uh, they're offering stimulus to for the formal bus sector. So if stimulus for public transportation is a possibility, um, then we could start to think about moving towards growth cost contracting as a possibility, meaning that uh, as Chris explained, um, the, the fares would be collected by the government and paid to, to, the, um, to the operators by the kilometer. Drivers could be salaried instead of uh, being paid whatever they're collecting that day, which would be a big relief to them. And buses could also operate on a schedule, which is a win-win for, for everybody, for the passengers too. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, Annie, for that. Uh, Engineer Gitao, are you on board? Uh, it looks like uh, Engineer is still having uh, connectivity issues. I will move to Mr. Edwin Mukabana. Uh, Mr. Mukabana, uh, we have heard you, I have personally heard you mention that change in government policy comes with expected costs or unexpected costs and challenges to business. Indeed, uh, the star of 4th April 2019 uh, reported that Kenya bus service had added, had, uh, added uh, 50 buses uh, to, uh, to your fleet bringing the company's total fleet to 283 buses. What assurance have you received from the government uh, so far? And here you'll be talking on behalf of all those who have invested uh, in the sector, that upon the inception of the BRT, that your investment will be safeguarded. Uh, Mr. Mukabana. I Thank you very much, engineer. I think uh, that's a very good question. Uh, yes, you can see that we've been growing some vehicles uh, to try and uh, upgrade the fleet size and also upgrade the, the, the fleet age of the vehicles that we have. But as we are, we are living in a very unpredictable environment, public transport, operation is a very unpredictable environment. It's unpredictable because we don't have a public transport uh, policy framework where you can know, for example, what is the investment policy going forward? What type of vehicles are going to be needed in the next five years? What emission uh, levels are you going to look for? Uh, until recently, there wasn't even uh, a BRT standard bus or uh, things like those ones. So as uh, investors in the industry, we just keep fighting with the uh, unpredictable environment, cutthroat competition and wasteful competition. You will not know, for example, which vehicles will be introduced onto your service or onto your route. You could be operating today at Kencom with a planned number of vehicles, and two other operators might be brought in uh, using different forces to try and take your market. Today, you could be operating thinking that uh, you are 
upscaling your capacity and tomorrow you find 14 seaters have been reintroduced into the system. There is uh, the issue of uh, legislation and regulations. Regulations being done every day with no consultations. Regulations that have got no economic social impact assessment. They just come in and when you ask them, yes, you introduced this regulation. Uh, what have you benefited three years down the road? Nobody will know what it is. Now, coming with the BRT makes things a bit, a little more difficult because uh, BRT is coming on a corridor and is coming to take a bit of your market. Sometimes nobody has done proper service plans to see how there will be integration with the BRT. When that has been done, then you find people get jittery, not only the investors, but even the staff that are working in the system. So in my opinion, the investment climate has not been good, it continues to be bad, but we are hoping with the engagement that we have had with uh, the BRT uh, in, in introduction, where we are hoping that um, BRT line two is going to, to be a good one where operators are going to form a bus operating company. Then there will be a traffic contract along the lines of what uh, uh, Chris Cross has talked about. We have operators that have been taken through that. Some benchmarking trips have been made. But the worst of the fears we have is what Chris talked about, risk mitigation. The risks in the business, the government doesn't want to take care and they don't want to know. We don't know when we start this, whether the government will take a bit of risk and how much risk. We are hoping they will be able to take risk. And for the first time, we are hoping the government will start putting money into public transport as a public good, just like they put into health and put into education. Because then that way we shall start seeing public transport being uh, something that you can go and invest in. So to go back to your question, I think as public transport operators, we are a bit agey. We don't know how we're going to go forward, but we are hoping that um, with the recent environment, with people coming in like yourselves, uh, people like uh, now Engineer Gitao, you talk to them and you see, uh, you, can, you, you, can, you can correlate, you can see they can already, they understand what transport is. Uh, Rehab will tell you, when we started 2004, 2005, they would not listen. You talked subsidy and they snobbed and they looked aside and they thought you were joking, but now, People can listen. You can see even money being put aside by NMS to develop stages. They could still be rudimentary, but you can see money being put into developing stages. This is a good thing. We are hoping that will continue to assist the operators. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Mukabana, uh, for those insights. I'm happy to hear that uh, there's some light at the end of the tunnel. And uh, uh, maybe to add uh, to that, and maybe perhaps even to answer some of the uh, your fears, we have Engineer Gitao. I think now he's on board. Uh, Engineer Gitao, can you hear me? Uh, Engineer Gitao, um, maybe we can have Carol uh, get uh, Engineer Gitao on board. We need him to uh, uh, answer some of the questions, many questions for Engineer Gitao. Uh, I will go back to Annie. Uh, Annie. Uh, Nairobi and other cities in Africa are keen to draw lessons uh, from your experience during the implementation of BRT and the, as, uh, the associated uh, industry transition uh, for the rear via in Johannesburg. 
the Trans Jakarta in Indonesia, and the DART in Dar es Salaam. Uh, what would you consider as the number one uh, risk in public transport transition process? And what's your advice uh, to cities like Nairobi, which are just about uh, uh, planning and uh, starting to reform the sector and to introduce the BRT? Uh, Annie, welcome. Thank you. <clears throat> so, I mean, all, all of those cities that you that you named used BRT to ref as a mechanism for reforming their informal industries. They all decided to create formal companies uh, and reform the taxi sector. Um, those companies, the idea was to create companies that could be competitive uh, with and, and have the potential even to bid in other cities as they grow. Um, one of the lessons that, that we learned along the way is that it's very important to work with the directly affected operators. So these are the people who are actually operating on the corridor that the BRT is planned to operate on and not just any operators in the city. Um, Johannesburg and Cape Town both did this and it was a very good decision. Um, it helps to avoid the risk of, sh of a strike from the operators who are already operating on that corridor, but it's also the right thing to do because those operators, their livelihoods are at stake when you, when you put a BRT on a corridor. So bringing them in rather than leaving them out is very important. Um, it takes government initiative to actually identify and may, uh, who the affected operators are, make sure that those affected operators have properly selected um, a leader, and then to figure out who the drivers are that, are that are associated with those operators. So it does take a bit of work on the part of the government. Um, another lesson that we learned is the importance of creating multiple companies ra uh, rather than just one company. So for example, Johannesburg created only one company in their phase one implementation of Rayavaya. Cape Town actually created three companies in their phase one implementation. Um, the benefit of having more than one company is that if, for example, one of the companies is performing badly uh, or even just not, not performing according to the, uh, what's in the contract, it's possible for one of the other companies to, to take over um, the, the routes of the company that's failing. This will allow the system to continue operating without having to stop. If you only have one company, the system has to stop until you have someone to operate it. Um, I'm pretty sure that, that in Cape Town, one of the companies took over a few of the routes from one of the others, but um, I, I could be wrong about that. Um, another lesson uh, is not to negotiate directly with the operators, but to have a, a competitive tender. There are cases when negotiations can work, but generally there, there, are, there can be problems with that. Um, a competitive tender with preference for including existing operators, meaning that um, that the bid get the bid gets extra points if the affected operators are included in the bid tends to be the best way of doing it. We call that a managed competitive tender. Um, it results in a better price and a quicker timeline. Um, in Johannesburg, for example, the the price was about 30% higher than it what it should have been because of the negotiation and the timeline was dragged way out like years in order to before the the system could actually start running um, because they only had one company to negotiate with and there was no competition. Um, the biggest risk I would say in, um, in the whole process is that the government doesn't lead, lead the process. So, um, you know, from, right from the beginning with planning in uh, South Africa and Dar es Salaam and uh, Indonesia, everybody did some, a lot of upfront planning. They developed financial models so that they could understand exactly what the uh, financial picture would be for each entity that was involved. They developed a business, uh, business plan that said uh, how all of the entities would relate to each other. A uh, business plan is really important. It might say something like there needs to be third-party fair collection, which as Chris explained, is, is very important because it allows the government to take control over the fair collection and, with, and withhold payments to operators according to um, any kind of factors in the contract like uh, quality of service factors, penalties. 
Um, so that business plan is really important. If the government doesn't do that, then and leaves it open to the industry to sort of lead, then you might not end up with a with a third party fair collection because it may not be in the industry's interest to, to choose to go in that direction. Um, Cape Town also had something called a prospectus, which was a living document that um, was constantly updated to, to show the industry what exactly the government was offering um, so that the industry could plan. Um, Dar es Salaam did start out with a lot of this upfront planning, but ultimately some, some things happened where the, um, the third part, there was no third party fair collection in the end and the government to some degree lost control over the quality of service um, because the operators collecting the fare directly, it would be great to see Dar es Salaam move in the direction of third party fare collection. Um, so I think the, again, the biggest risk is that the government doesn't lead the, the process and, and we need to make sure that, that, that they do. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Annie, for those. Uh, uh, Can you hear me now, Jerry? Uh, yes, Francis Gitao. Okay, thank thank you, you very much for joining us. Sorry, yes. I, had, I, had I had a lot of technological problems, but now I'm on board. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. We have just learned from Annie that uh, mm -hmm. some of the key areas that, uh, from her experience, some of the key areas that we need to look out for. One is forming formal companies to operate the BRT. Uh, another uh, key area is, uh, which is very important is to work with the affected uh, operators. Uh, and we are told that uh, Johannesburg and Cape Town uh, did that uh, because they are actually uh, the BRT will, the, the introduction of the BRT will obviously affect their livelihoods. The importance of creating multiple companies and not negotiating directly with the operator, but going for an open tender. And the biggest risk is if the government does not lead the process. So, Ijinia uh, Gitao, uh, let me come to you. Uh, maybe the first uh, question uh, is... Uh, I, I can remember it, I have it. You have it? <laughs> yes, yeah, so I was listening to you, Madam Jerry. You actually said it is required that public health protocols be observed in the uh, public transport and, yes. and provide sanitization and also keeping distances. The cost implications and the aspect that the, the truth is this burden is being loaded on, on, on commuters. So what you are asking yes. is whether government has considered to whether we can subsidize uh, public transport fares so that that burden is not taken up by commuters. Jerry, that is a very good question to ask. Uh, but as you know, our industry currently has the uh, observatory, uh, no uh, uh, reliable monitoring system. You know, you wouldn't, there's no, a particular operational standard that uh, has been set and therefore uh, operations are much more private sector. Uh, and uh, during the COVID uh, period, uh, looking at the protocols that were set, it, there was also some kind of a caveat on travel. It was only for essential services. So we had very few travelers. In fact, as I had uh, Mukabana say, um, it was a period of loss to every sector in the economy. Uh, some of the people who traveled during COVID uh, were not traveling for work-based or school-based essential travel. Uh, and therefore, if you look at the rationale of subsidizing uh, COVID uh, journeys, uh, that would have been quite a challenge. We, did, we, don't, we have not yet developed a data culture where you can be able to analyze and demarcate which section of mobility you can subsidize at whatever time. As uh, it was observed by our first presenter that uh, in Africa, uh, there's still no organized transport. And as we sit here as Namata, our greatest effort is to ensure that we end up with an organized transport. We are not looking at a position where the government becomes the bossman of public transport. We are looking at government becoming a partner and that's why when I had Mukabana, though uh, uh, talking about regulations being done, 
without consultation. Mukabana is actually referring to some of the institutions which have been, to, been trying to regulate the space that they have not invested in. But when we are talking with uh, Mukabana, our co-chair in the task force that is seeing this transformation, we are so much of a, we have a meeting of minds. We exactly know how uh, and uh, uh, what we require to, 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 to change in the public transport operations today. And uh, if you check the, uh, the manual, the, the guideline that you have launched today, that uh, uh, cost, uh, Chris Cost uh, went through, uh, issues to do with elimination of parallel routes, issues related with the freight depots and uh, you know depots being run by government and maybe operated on a maintenance standard, fare being an, a, a separate operation, all these things we've been discussing at the task force level, because we have even talked about the infrastructure development standards. Key being in Kenya, we would want to start with a, a BRT dedicated corridor, because if we lose out on that high level standing for high quality service, then uh, we may never achieve it in the future. If we said we went through the bus, uh, city bus way, and then we are in the mix of things, I think we, we better start with the high standard we want to see in the future. Let it be slow, but let it happen in accordance to the vision of having, for having a rapid mobility and then high capacity. And as you well know, all of us in Kenya don't, now don't want to see individualized motorists in the CBD. If they come to the CBD, we would want to see that they, there is a price to pay. In fact, when you talk about congestion in Kenya, you're not talking about the parent transit. The matatus are actually a gift to people of Kenya. Because if these people of Kenya did not have matatus, I wonder how they would be going to school. I went to school on matatus. I, I enjoyed my university in matatus. My dating was wonderful in matatus. What is it about matatus that we are fighting about? Matatus are great uh, input to our 30 years of development. And now we are very happy to have gentlemen like Mukabana and the members of the task force who are ready to transform these disorganized, uh, competitive uh, industrial uh, paradigm and uh, introduce a reliable service that has a transport service contract that actually describes a quality, a sub, a quality of service in terms of a criteria and indicators that can help us improve through a process. We don't think we'll do a bracadabra and have it, but we consider it to be a process. We have started with that uh, consultation with the task force who are the operators in the urban space on the tra transit. And we have thought about how would you best prefer to move from this status to the next level? And they say, yes, we could come together as a bus operating company that will have professional management, that they can also be able to invest on a new or a high quality standard of fit that will ensure safety and they can actually be predictable in its operation. And that means we are still working with them on the business plans. We have uh, had the opportunity to have great capacity like the one provided by ITDP. I remember ITDP actually helped us get a service plan in place, even to be able to configure or to have a concept on the infrastructure we needed to develop. So those partnerships, that learning from the uh, Transmillennia South Africa, Bogot, all, this, all these things we learned from the Risanam you know, we, we, we are we're using them so that we do not repeat uh, mistakes that, uh, not even mistakes, but the learning curve does not become as steeper as in other jurisdictions. We agree with you, multiple companies, that's what we are going to develop on each route. But again, in Nairobi looking at, uh, in Nairobi being a reservoir of journeys, everybody is passing through the CBD like a nucleus then it is critical to think about having uh, circular routes that can be able to actually meet the, the you know, demand optimally and optimize on operations rather than having line by line operations. It could, if we could have the core uh, infrastructure developed, it would be easy 
to create an operational plan that actually uh, is, is optimized uh, based on the demand streams that we need to meet. But one thing, Jerry, you must be uh, sure about in Kenya, government is ready to lead the process. And I think this process started with government. Of course, it is started with development partners and people like ITDP who are saying mobility in the city is unsustainable. It is inefficient. It is not equitable. We are having motorized traffic take the fair share of transport infrastructure. There is a case of sustainable mobility and that uh, is what we are going to work towards even with our partners in the private sector I think we are all committed to ensure that we reorganize the city uh, mobility map so that it's sustainable, it is uh, equitable, and it is able to bring a difference and resuscitate the urban core. Thank you, Madam Jerry. Sorry for taking so much time. Uh, thank you, Brother Engineer. I'm happy to hear you uh, mention those words, sustainable, equitable. Those are very good words. Uh, very applicable to our situation. Uh, I will uh, pose another question to you, uh, Eugenia Gitao. There are concerns around the labor issues and the integration of the current workers in the reformed uh, public transport system. To what extent is NAMATA or government engaging with the matatu workers in Nairobi? And what is your value proposition to the workers uh, to convince them to support the proposed uh, public transport reforms and especially the BRT? Uh, thank you, Madam Jerry. I think uh, the concerns around labor, yes. Of course, when you look at the, uh, the ad game, the ad game is that uh, the mobility of things around the city will be rapid, will be high capacity, but again, if you look at the opportunity in Kenya to reconfigure a lot of feeder net uh, route routes uh, that will actually only, our, our only uh, change there will be the service quality in terms of training the crew and uh, having high quality jobs in terms of saying, we do not want to see a part-time working. We want trained, salaried people with jobs, actual jobs. Currently, the situation is pathetic because you cannot call a matatu job because it's quite temporary. It has no future, has no career path. And working with the Federation of Public Transport Services, whose chairman now is currently my brother, Edwin Mukabana. And I, 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 I want to congratulate gentlemen like Mukabana because they are bold enough to say, it is time to change. We will have high quality jobs. But again, we have a numerous feeder network. And therefore, the impact on the labor uh, holding of the entire matato industry will not be as huge as some uh, studies have tried, tried to show. And again, if you look at Tikarud alone, we even in the first instant, we are developing over 20 something uh, stations. We are talking about uh, cleaning. We are talking about secondary uh, services like uh, security, you know, maintenance, uh, we'll have high quality jobs. I think the great thing is that the jobs we are moving from that part-time jobbing to a quality job that can attract uh, a future. And then that can actually be able to be trained and informed. And I think this Matatu transformation to an organized service will only benefit the Matatu industry. We may need more than we have uh, in the industry now, uh, looking at the kind of uh, service quality we are talking about. Quality cannot be maintained by numbers only, but again, high quality human capital. So it is in the value, it is in the value of the job we hold that we think we hold the greatest, uh, you know, attraction. Uh, thank you, thank you very much, uh, engineer, for that. Uh, we are running out of time. Uh, so I'll give each one of you a chance to give us a, a parting shot. And uh, we can start uh, with uh, Mr. Kabana. And I would like you, as you give us your parting shot, to comment very briefly on uh, use of technology 
and uh, why we have not uh, quite uh, been able to exploit uh, technology in uh, public transport in Kenya. Mr. Mukabana. Uh, thank you very much. I think uh, technology uh, has not been, the uptake has not been very good, uh, but we are seeing uh, quite a bit of young men coming up with uh, different uh, apps and different, uh, uh, different, different applications and, and, and many other things they are trying to do, cashless ticketing, uh, journey, journey planners, uh, the scheduling, most of them are coming. I think the biggest problem is that for you to do a good transport system uh, technology, you must be able to know how a good transport system works. And a lot of our young men, all they have seen is the Matatu system. And they do not know how a good transport system works. So when they are developing technology, that is developing that technology based on what is happening now. For example, somebody will develop a technology based on QE, vehicles QE, but in a really world good transport system, it is on a schedule. Now, how do you do schedules? It becomes a very different thing. Others come and they develop technology based on, uh, on, on uh, the payment system, the mobile money, the card system, the POS, but they do not know how an automatic fare system works. Now, for you to do an automatic fare system, you must know the different fare structures that exist, the stages, how they are mapped, the kilometers that are involved in it, and how the machine itself should work, how many things. So a lot of them, when they have done this and we put it on test parameters, you find they get 50%, 30%, 40%. But I must say there has been a lot of uh, interest and there are few people uh, whose ticketing systems we have checked and they look quite okay. So the uptake of technology is coming in, but as government and operators, we need to sit down and first of all say, what is the correct way of operating? Then the technology people will start saying, now we want to provide you with this particular thing. Uh, it all goes to capacity building in public transport. Engineer, you know that this is the biggest problem we have. We have to build capacity. To, for people to start talking the way you are talking, how many of us can be able to articulate things from your point of view? How many of our operators are able to do that? Maybe from where we sit, and I'm fighting for this, we need a public transport institute. A tra sorry, a transport institute. So that we start training our engineers, plan, transport planners, we start having uh, technology providers for transport so that we now start producing, just like Ministry of Health produces its staff, transport produces its staff. Once we do that, then the uptake of technology will start flowing by itself. Thank you very much. Thank you so much uh, for that uh, information. Uh, Annie Winstock. Your parting shot. Um, yeah, I mean, we're seeing a lot of progress on industry transition in Africa and around the world, both in cities that are implementing BRT and cities that are not implementing BRT systems. Um, having cooperatives like in Nairobi and like in many cities can be a really important stepping stone on the way to full corporatization. Um, but I, I mean, Corporate, full corporatization is a, a great end goal because it provides owners of the companies the opportunity to really grow, potentially even to step into other industries. Um, and, and having a full company also means that the quality of service can be even greater based on all of the efficiencies brought by, by having a company. Um, so I hope the quick guide will be useful in helping to, con to continue to advance the progress that we've already been seeing um, in Nairobi and in Africa more generally. Um, and thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Annie. Uh, Ijinia Gitao, your parting shot. Very I, th I, th I think engineer Jerry only to ask for partnership and more cross collaboration because when you talk about a, a, a reliable, uh, the reliability of a service, 
uh, and operations with a regulatory framework. Uh, all this work requires a strong public transport authority. And Nairobi is very bold in creating a public transport authority around five counties. Those are five county governments, including a city, which is Nairobi. It's not going to be easy. We need a lot of collaboration. We need a lot of hard holding. We need a lot of voluntary proactive uh, uh, assistance. And uh, as I listened to Mr. Neji Labi, and he was talking about urban mobility division in the African bank, uh, issues related to technical assistance and all these being available to public transport operations. I think it is time also to, to think about the private sector operations because like in most cities, everything is industry-based. It's a bottom line issue. It's an economy, it's an, it's an economic activity that touches thousands of lives. It's a multi-billion sector, shilling sector. You cannot just pick it from the private hands place it on the public hard for capacity. It is time we actually develop programs that can help the private sector think in sync with the public sector and then develop even the regulatory framework as, as in partnership so that we understand each other better. And then we provide a public service that has a quality that is negotiated maybe through a transport service, service contract. So that is a win-win situation so that we are not talking to them, we are talking with them. And then we are planning with them and then we are discussing investment with them. And as Madame Heather talked about a business plan, yes, that business plan again is so critical, even for example in Nairobi, for it to be the offering whereby the private sector will be able to be willing to come on board with the public sector to provide a public service that will change the quality of life. And then it will make the city more livable, equitable and have you know the city breathe again. So for me, uh, I, I kindly request for more collaboration, a lot of support to a very young public transport authority and to embrace the proactive uh, mind like ITDP has done all the time to call and even review designs for us. And then you're actually pushing us, have you checked my review? Have you followed up on it? Never get tired. Please, because you know in government, again, there is a lot of bureaucracy that makes everything routine, but this is time to think differently and I want to submit. Thank you so much, Igine Jerry. Uh, thank you very much, Igine Agitao. Uh, maybe we can conclude on that note, partnership and collaboration, hand-holding, win-win situation. Very good words. Thank you so much, uh, our panelists today. Uh, we know you are very busy people, but you are able to make time to join us today. Thank you. I'll hand over to uh, Rehab to continue with the program. Thank you very much, Engineer Jerry and your team of experts. I have learned a lot. This journey cannot be a sprint, it is a marathon, but we are already on the track and we are doing very well. Uh, I think we've come to the end of our session. I'd like to thank each participant. I don't see any new questions. Thank you for those who participated in the chat. There's a lot of exchange, a lot of learning. Uh, as questions were asked, they were answered, and I want to thank those that have responded. I see my colleague Ronald Lokatare from Dar es Salaam, who has joined and has been very, very active. And as you all know, he has spearheaded a very successful phase one BRT going to phase two and three. And I've asked him to give us the closing remarks for this session, because he'll be a very relevant person to do that. Uh, after Ronald speaks, I think all I can say, uh, unless Chris has new announcements, is that this is a quick guide that we hope cities beyond the Kenyan cities will pick, use. Again, thank you ADB that you have opened this unit and that you're ready to support cities in their journey on uh, modernizing the bus sector. We truly, truly thank you for that offer. So again, I want to thank you all for your participation. 
let's keep the conversation going. Let's keep nagging where we must and let's keep hope alive. So without much ado, I want to thank each one of you and to invite Ronald to give us some closing remarks. Thank you. Yes, good, good, good afternoon. Uh, how are you all? I'm speaking from Dodoma actually. Uh, we, were, we were having the swearing in of our president who has just won an election. So I'm in an hotel and uh, the connections is not very reliable, but uh, I, I've managed to get connected. So I'm very grateful for this discussion. That's why even when I was coming from the inauguration or the swearing in, I tried to get the connection and join you. And I've seen the discussions are, are very good. Uh, Dar es Salaam is a bit ahead, I could say, but at one time, I believe we'll all be dealing with the same issues at some level, where Nairobi and other cities will also have the BRT. So the issues discussed today uh, are very relevant. Uh, for example, uh, uh, Chris talked about the, what is needed to be done to shift from net cost to gross cost. We, Dar es Salaam, are using net cost in our BRT, but we're also shifting to gross cost and the benefits are there to, to do so. So I see that the advice we're getting from this uh, meeting today is taking us in the right direction. But I also note that uh, Namata is also working with the, with the, 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 the paratransit. I mean, the, 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 the local buses that are still operating, they're still concerned and looking into how they should operate better. Uh, that is also very good uh, because in our case, I don't deal with them directly in that because they are dealt with, with another regulatory body called LATRA, Land and Transport Regulatory Authority. So it's good to also uh, work with them. Even me with BRT, I don't operate in all the routes in Dar es Salaam currently. So I, work, I have to meet and talk to the people who own, we call them Daladala. For example, if I don't have a service that can go to a certain route due to some region, maybe flooding and so on, I have to talk to the Daladala people to see how they can bridge the gap. So we need to have this continuous relationship with them and they are very volatile people. You have to handle them well. If they become unhappy, they can make your day very bad and sad. So uh, regarding that, I'm grateful about that, but also, uh, we talked about uh, what the government should do and so on, government build the depots. That's also important, we did that. But there are these arguments, should they pay rent? Uh, who does the maintenance and so on? Uh, basically in our case, the operator does the day-to-day -day maintenance. But if there's a major thing to be done, they put their hands down and say, please government come and do this because you own the building. So to me, I think we should have clear contracts uh, that spell out uh, who does what. Otherwise, you may get into some problem and a bus depot is very key for having bus operations uh, operating well. For example, if I, he closes down uh, bus services, it affects all of us, even me at that. It affects everyone. So you need to have the operators uh, working. So uh, we heard about the transition, uh, what we need to do. And I think also the issue of labor standards, there's a recommendation that maybe we should shift from target, uh, uh, having them drivers do target uh, assignments to make their days uh, remuneration to having contracts. We have done that, but what I can tell you, even if you put the contracts, there are, there are other challenges that also emerge like driver's attitude, road safety, accidents, we still have them, even though we are paying them monthly salaries and they don't worry about, uh, uh, do I need to get us X number of passengers? So I, I see that uh, let us continue to learn. Otherwise, uh, uh, we are very grateful for uh, Madam Heather launching this guide, which will greatly help us and I would also like to further comment on if we could also be helped or assisted to know what, uh, get a guide on what type of buses should we take? What type of buses could, should we buy? Should we buy diesel? Should we buy CNG? CNG is compressed natural gas. Or should we buy electric buses? 
which should we use? Because when you work with the financial models and so on, they all bring different stories uh, in terms of which is better in terms of cost-wise and uh, financial viability. Honestly, electric buses seem to be the word of the, the catch word today in the modern world. But uh, we also have CNG and we have this. So if we could get guidance in that, otherwise I'd like to thank a lot ADB. ADB because they are supporting public transport in Dar es Salaam, they are financing the phase two, which whose construction is currently ongoing and maybe will be completed in one or in a couple of years and they are probably going to finance another phase. We really thank them for supporting the public transport. I, I, I'd like to also thank ITDP because I, I could say they are the ones who brought this idea here into Africa, even into Dar es Salaam. They are the ones who brought it up and uh, I congratulate them for having a very good mobilized meeting, though I attended it very late. And congratulations to the city of Jakarta who won the STA award this for 2021. Otherwise, I also like to thank uh, Kenya Namata, uh, the Kenya ITDP team. Uh, Namata, my colleague there, the CEO, we've met, we've been discussing, we need to continue discussing and uh, sharing our experiences to improve public transport. The, we will always have these challenges in public transport, uh, so we need to work together and have common uh, solutions. I also like to thank the KBS, I think it's KBS, who also had their chairman working being organized is very good and uh, yes with those uh, closing remarks uh, we in Tanzania are looking forward to continue working very closely with you uh, in any uh, any aspects technical social environmental and uh, I'd like to say God bless you all and thank you for listening to me thank you very much Ronald thank you everyone for your participation and congratulations for Tanzania getting their president again, and we pray that you continue with BRT and other public transport projects. Uh, Thank you. Yes, and less advised otherwise, I want to say that this meeting was a launch. We can go on and on. The learning is a lot, uh, but again, to thank each one of you for actively participating and kindly continue engaging so that as the UN Habitat says, we have sustainability and sustainable cities in Africa. Thank you very much and uh, have a good evening or morning or evening, depending on where you are. Thank you. Uh, uh, sorry, I just thought, I forgot to just say thank you also to UN Habitat. Please, please forgive me. UN Habitat are also very good supporters. They engage us, they take us around the world to see this and that. Thank you so much, UN Habitat. It just skipped my mind. I think I'm still, because I was in the sun for hours today, you know, the inauguration. It was, we were sitting baked in the sun and I, I'm not very, I'm not in my tip top condition, honestly. <laughs> so my forgiveness. UN Habitat, thank you so much and welcome to Tanzania also. Well understood. Thank you that you even agreed to give the closing remarks. Uh, UN Habitat will continue being a catalyst for many things. We work from the background, but we are very excited to be part of this process. Thank you again. So uh, unless there's anything else, we can leave the meeting now. And thank you, ITDP. Thank you, panelists, for all your good work. Thank you, Rehab. Bye-bye. Yep. <laughs> Bye. Bye-bye, thank you. Goodbye. Thank you, Heather. Thank you, Nigeri. bye-bye. Bye-bye.